I believe that it's important to distinguish phenomenology from the kind of science that reflects simply on this apophantic domain, on the domain of meanings. If philosophy is not adequately defined by saying, well, it clarifies meanings. You're, that's one stage, but it has to do more. We have access to the apophantic domain through I would call, what I would call propositional reflection, which is radically different from transcendental philosophical reflection. The philosophical examination of truth is different from the logical analysis of meaning. Husserl examines consciousness and psychological reality insofar as it enters into the activities of intellect or noose. He studies consciousness and psychological things insofar as they enter into truth. Just as Plato and Aristotle consider the natural material world as inherently mobile and pervaded by change, so Husserl thinks of the psychological world as in perpetual motion. He sometimes calls consciousness a Heraclitean stream, and he says that the world is the world we live in and experience is given to us ständig in strömender Jeweiligkeit. It's a beautiful phrase, and these are poetic phrases you find in the Husserlian corpus that are quite attractive. Uh, even in his own private manuscripts, you find them every so often. Ständig in strömender Jeweiligkeit. Jeweiligkeit being so uh, contingent and incidental, the, the present moment. It's always flowing, and yet it's always flowing. So there's a kind of stability of form even in this incessant motion. Now, Aristotle transcends the wor world of matter and motion by discovering substance, while Husserl discovers the identity of things, an identity confirmed and targeted by categorial intentionality, which is an activity of intellect. Husserl also deals with the two classical counter-philosophical positions that I mentioned earlier, materialist atomism and sophistry. He differentiates his philosophy from the worldly science of mathematical physics. And he also differentiates it from the psychologism and historicism that were given an even more powerful form in our time by Nietzsche, even though Husserl did not explicitly respond to his work. Husserl achieves this definition of the special status of philosophy, especially in his analysis of the transcendental reduction, in which he opens the dimension or the space in which philosophical language and discourse find their place. We can interpret his turn to the subject not as an innovation, but as a return in a modern vocabulary to the perennial philosophical issue. This achievement is not a going back in time, but a movement to what is always there as a human possibility, a, a philosophical possibility. That concludes the first part of my talk to try to show how Husserl rejoins classical philosophy in turning us to the philosophical life and more than just entering it, but explaining what it means, explaining through these rather complicated arguments of the reduction and the epoche of what it means to adopt a philosophical perspective on things. Few philosophers have done that as extensively as Husserl did. My second uh, section is uh, to uh, include some quotations from a philosopher one might not commonly associate with Husserl. Uh, the title of the second section is Some Remarks from Leo Strauss. I will use some quotations from the writings of Leo Strauss to confirm my interpretation of Husserl. Strauss is recognized as a major figure in the revival of classical political philosophy in the 20th century. There is practically no treatment of political philosophy in Husserl, but Strauss still acknowledged the importance of his work. In a letter to Eric Vogelin, dated May 9, 1934, Strauss writes, Husserl has seen with incomparable clarity that the restoration of philosophy or science presupposes the restoration of the Platonic Aristotelian level of questioning, unquote. Stroud speaks not about any particular question, but about a level of questioning, a, a perspective. I would rather call it a dimension of inquiry, but the difference between the two spatial metaphors is irrelevant. 
The main point is that a particular kind of thinking is called for, that it differs from standard and partial thinking, and that Husserl is vividly aware of its distinctness. The kind of questioning introduced by Husserl will be of considerable significance for political philosophy as well. Strauss continues, quote, Husserl's ego, egology, study of the ego, can be understood not only as an answer to the Platonic Aristotelian, it can be under, let me start again, Husserl's egology can be understood only as an answer to the Platonic Aristotelian question regarding nous, intellect. In another letter written a few months later, Strauss repeats this observation concerning nous and mentions, quote, the enormous difficulties of understanding Aristotle's De Anima 3.5, which is, of course, the passage on the agent intellect. Thus, uh, Strauss thus connects Husserl's work more specifically with the issue of the active or agent intellect in the Aristotelian tradition. In another place, in an essay entitled Philosophy as a Rigorous Science and Political Philosophy, Strauss mentions the neo-Kantianism of the Marburg School which interested him during his student years, and he said that Husserl once told him, the Marburg School begins with the roof, while I begin with the foundation. Now these remarks of Strauss can help us discuss how Husserl revives the classical question of human knowing, the classical question of intellect or news. It's true that Husserl says he wants to begin with the deepest foundations of consciousness, that he wishes to start with the foundation and not with the roof. But it seems to me that all his analyses already have the dimension of intellect in view. Even when he analyzes pre-predicative experience, for example, he thinks of it as a foundation for categorial and predicative activity. His phenomenology is never a study of sheer sensibility, but of sensibility pervaded by and leading to reason and intelligence. In fact, it's hard to examine how anyone could analyze sheer sensibility. There would be nothing there to think about, nothing to grip. And if we consider some of the major themes in Husserl's work, we will find that they each articulate some way in which intellect realizes itself within human consciousness. Husserl is concerned with what Thomas Prufer, again, I'd quote him, has called by the very nice phrase, the anthropology of noose. Somehow, mind, intellect is anthropological, and that is obviously a serious problem. How can that happen? And it's a perennial ancient problem. I would like to examine three instances of this presence of intellect in our experience as they are explored by Husserl. So these are quick, three quick sketches where uh, uh, intellect in its human realization are, is analyzed by Husserl. Now, first of all, consider the ideality of meaning, the fact that when we say something and then repeat it later and have someone else repeat it, uh, remember it, and so on, it's always the same thing. Uh, Husserl often uses the Pythagorean theorem. It's always the same theorem. Uh, so when we, uh, he insists that when a, a proposition or judgment or any other categorical entity, mathematical one, returns in our awareness, it always recurs as exactly the same despite our dif the difference in its location in our personal history. It also returns as the same when it's possessed by different minds. If a proposition did not occur as ideally the same, it, would not, it could not serve as a premise in an argument. It could not be contradicted or confirmed by others, could not be questioned or doubted. Without such ideality, there would be no proofs or theorems, no rhetoric or dialectics, and no laws for political life. Furthermore, this ideality of a proposition occurs even across the differences between states of vagueness and distinctness, when we only vaguely grasp a proposition, if we ach achieve a judgment vaguely and then bring it to distinctness, we actually carry it out, which we do when we effectively carry it out after we have only passively and confusedly received it, one and the same judgment is there to be identified in both modes. 
Such ideality is the work of intellect, even vagueness, and confusion is a state of intellectual activity. And then secondly, another example of the role of intellect in, in uh, human beings, consider the act of remembering, of recollection. Human remembering, as described by Husserl, is the rec recollection carried out by a rational agent. When we remember something we, that we experienced in the past, we displace ourselves into that past situation and we recall not only the thing that we remember but also ourselves as experiencing it. We have a more or less explicit awareness <coughs> of our own past selves. Excuse me. This can also be problematic in that things that happened to us in the past keep coming back. We can't get rid of them. <coughs> we have a more or less explicit awareness of our own past selves. We thereby become more present to ourselves and our identity is enhanced. Our own personal identity comes into play in memory and this kind of identification is the work of an intellect that has become involved in imagination and in other forms of internal sensibility. This is part of the anthropology of news. Uh, <clears throat> Without the use of words, a mind would not be real. It's an intellectual self that can possess itself in this remembered way, as well as in the kind of displacements that occur, the Versetzungen, in fantasy and in anticipation of our own future selves. 